Well, as you may know, today has been set aside for my candidacy message because, as we heard, Pastor is going to be retiring here in the next few months or transitioning to that. And so uh, the church uh, offered me the opportunity to, to be a lead pastor here. And um, one of the things that people, you know, ask me about is like, you know, is that something you want to do? And I, I, just, I just tell them the same thing. Like, I say yes to God. You know, if God wants me to serve, then I'm going to serve. And I know he wants me to serve. So I, my whole life, I just keep saying yes. When he said go to Bible college, I said yes. When the church asked me to come back here and be youth pastor, I said yes. So I'm just saying my next yes. And um, I just thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. And, uh, you know, it's, it's God's will. It's God's will for today. And I have to tell you, God, God does not want me to talk about myself today. Um, <laughs> and I'm being serious. He really gave me a word for our church today. And that's what's important. What's important is what God wants to share with us. And, and so I think that, you know, I want, I want us to kind of put aside the whole candidacy thing today and just really hear from God what we need today. Does that sound good? You know, let's, let's put that stuff to, to the formalities to the side and let's focus on what God has for us here in his word. And it's interesting because when the transition team uh, asked me to speak, they picked Pentecost Sunday, which is today. And I was like, yes. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. But Calvary is an Assemblies of God church. We believe in Pentecost. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon his people to be witnesses and to do great signs and wonders on earth for the kingdom of God. And so we're going to talk about the, that today. So if you would go to Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles, and I'm going to be preaching the New Living Translation uh, using that. And we'll focus not on all the way through. Yeah, we'll focus through 18. So Acts chapter 2, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So you're in the New Testament. Now the word Pentecost means... 50th, and it's 50 days after the second Passover that the Jews celebrated the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. So this was a time for them where they were all in Jerusalem ready to celebrate the Feast of Harvest. There was two of them a year. And so, I mean, it's possible that millions of Jews were in there in Jerusalem at this time, gathered to celebrate. Shops are closed. You know, uh, no work is being done. It's party time. And it's cool because feast of weeks or harvest meant something new coming. The new crops coming, the new harvest coming. And I think, wow, that's pretty cool. Like the Holy Spirit uh, is working in his brand new outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church, right? In Acts 2, you'll read in a second. But then it's interesting because Calvary is in a new phase where it's a new season, but we're a continuing season of what God's already been doing. And God has a plan for this church because he chose this day for us to celebrate Pentecost and also make a big decision for our church as we move forward. So I think that's just so cool. And historically, uh, Jerusalem would be packed during this time of harvest. Uh, the streets were clogged, so to say, with Jews of all different nations coming together to, to do this, this festival. So we're going to read in that context in chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, and when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own language being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, 
Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. So imagine we just worshiped in English. Imagine worshiping, saying all the good things that God has done in a variety of languages, and someone understood what you were saying. That was from those nations. That's what was going on here. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward. Now, this is the Peter that denied Jesus three times, ran in shame, and all of a sudden, he's stepping forward to answer these Jews who also crucified Christ. And by the way, they're in Jerusalem where it all took, down, where it all took place and all went down. So there must be a change in Peter when the Holy Spirit comes upon him because he went from coward to a courageous preacher and evangelist. And this is what he says, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. <laughs> no, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. So prophecy is being fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Wow. Perfect timing for this to take place. Perfect timing for God to work through the Spirit, to speak many other languages because it's the one time of the year where all the Jews are together in Jerusalem and they're hearing the gospel being preached and Peter preaches this message and more and 3,000 men give their lives to Christ after this. God is smart, isn't he? If you want to spread the gospel from Jerusalem out, why not do it on the day that millions of Jews are there celebrating the Feast of Harvest. And now the Holy Spirit is baptizing the believers to be witnesses and speaking through them to communicate to them the goodness of God. And then Peter explains it all in the gospel message. So right here in this moment, the Pentecost started a revival. But what I wanna focus on today is, is what the Pentecost means for us and also how the disciples got to this place of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit for us today means the Holy Spirit, Jesus in us and by our side as if Jesus was with us. And I'll explain that more later. But the Holy Spirit is as if Jesus is beside us and living in us, working through us. And the Holy Spirit is also power and gifts from God for building up the church and to be an effective witness in this world. What fascinates me about this story is that the followers of Christ had, in a way, postured themselves to receive. They had postured and positioned themselves to receive what God has for them. What we're going to see in the next scripture is that Jesus said, to wait for my spirit to come. So if you go to uh, John 15, it'll be on the screen for you. They were expecting more, so they postured themselves for more because Jesus told them that more is coming. More is coming. And this is what he says in John 15, 26 through 27. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Luke 24, 46 through 49. This is before he's ascending into heaven. He says, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You who are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. 
You know, today I don't have time to give an argument for why the Holy Spirit is for today, but we have to understand something. Because there are teachings and beliefs out there that the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit is not for today. But I have to show you something here that the disciples in the book of Acts never questioned whether it was going to continue or not. You cannot find one question whether the Holy Spirit was powerful enough or whether it was supposed to continue or stop. You can't find any of that because that wasn't even a thought in their mind in the early church that the Holy Spirit was only going to work for a season and not for the rest of our lives. And by the way, if Jesus is telling you that the Holy Spirit is coming to clothe you in power, that's a lot of evidence right there to trust Jesus. I mean, we believe everything else Jesus says, right? We believe everything else he says. We must also cling to this as well and go, is this true? Is there a, is there a power from God on high through the Holy Spirit? Yeah, it seems like it. But even more so, Jesus says, just as my father promised. So not only do we have the son saying it, but you have God coming up behind Jesus kind of like this. Yeah, I promise the Holy Spirit for the church. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon this church. So Jesus is only proclaiming what he's supposed to proclaim from his father, that the Holy Spirit's going to come and you must wait in the city of Jerusalem for him to fill you with power. Now, if we go to Acts 1, 1 through 8, this is Jesus again. And uh, this is Luke, by the way. Luke writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he's writing to his friend Theophilus because he's been tracking everything that happened and wanted to send him the story of what happened so he could share the gospel with Theophilus. He said, in my first book, I told you, he's talking about Luke, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, so his resurrection, Jesus was on earth for 40 days. He appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? And he replied, the father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. And he changes their focus from freedom from Rome and setting the Jews free to really setting the world free from sin. And he says this, but you will receive power. So focus on this, guys. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to make a really important note about tongues real quick. Because I think a lot of people read Acts 2, and they get a little scared and intimidated by the word tongues and all the other references in the Bible. But notice these three scriptures about Jesus, he doesn't say focus on tongues, does he? He says, focus on the Holy Spirit coming and you will receive power. Too often I run into people from other churches or from just what they've been taught, raised, wherever they were from, or even maybe just lack of knowing everything the scripture says. And they say, you know, I got to get filled with the Holy, I gotta get filled with the Holy Spirit. No, they say, I need to speak in tongues. I need to speak in tongues. No. No, we don't need to speak in tongues. We need the full experience of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, to come upon us for power to be witnesses in this world. The motive is off when we make it about tongues. The focus is off. Sometimes it's driven by status. If I speak in tongues, I've arrived. If I prayed in tongues, I must have the Holy Spirit's power with me. Well, that is a sign. That's the first initial sign we see in Acts 2 and other references throughout the book of Acts. But that wasn't the point. The point was that they would wait for the Holy Spirit to clothe them with power to be witnesses, not to look more Christian. In fact, when you get the Holy Spirit, you're given more responsibility and you're becoming more like a servant of Christ with responsibility to use the power of God that he's given you. So it's not a privilege thing. It's a servant gift to serve God in the kingdom. 
and the Holy Spirit is for everyone. Something to notice here is in the text, we, we're usually seeing in scripture that the pillar of fire guides the church corporately, guides the Israelites corporately, right? We usually see there's one big pillar of fire and then, excuse me, <coughs> certain leaders are anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Moses gets help with the Holy Spirit. Uh, David, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon him. Samson, the Holy Spirit came upon him. It seems like God picks and chooses who gets the help of the Holy Spirit or it's corporate where the pillar of fire and the cloud by day, the presence, the fire of God is with them. But notice in this scripture, in Acts 2, it says that every single one of them had a piece of fire over their head. Do you know what that means? That the Holy Spirit is for all of us individually, not just corporately. And another thing to understand here too is that the Holy Spirit was for females as well, not just males. The Holy Spirit was gonna speak and prophesy through our female sisters in Christ. It wasn't just for one person. So the Holy Spirit does not discriminate, does he? The Holy Spirit is not racist. The Holy Spirit is not tunnel vision because how many nations were there that day and heard the wonders of God? Because the Holy Spirit is for every nation, gender, age, background, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit for children. Children will, will have visions and dreams. Why? Because the mission isn't about who is doing it. It's about who is in charge and it's Jesus Christ. It's about that. It's not about us. The mission is what God wants to accomplish through himself using us as a worthy vessel, humble vessel, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not about us. And he will come upon any of us if we seek more of him. But there's a key, I believe, in scripture, and this is what God put on my heart when I was praying a few weeks ago for today. And that's when he was like, this is not about you today. I have a word for the church. Not all these people are driving up to hear about you. I said, great, that's awesome, because I don't want to promote myself. That is not my, my life. So when I was praying, he began to show me postures that the early church had to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Attitudes, actions, behaviors. So let's go to the first one. And I truly believe we as a church have already been practicing these, but he wants us to practice them even more. He wants all of us to be on board. The postures of a church expecting more. Number one, the posture of obedience. They did what Jesus said to do. It was really simple. Go to Jerusalem and wait. That was it. I just put together a basketball hoop for my kids and our family, and it was like an entire book. I wish it was one piece of instruction, like put the pin in here and start shooting hoops. It wasn't like that. And I'll tell you, I'll use that for another story another day, but it was horrendous putting together. Jesus gave them one thing to do, and they did it. They obeyed. And just so you know, blessings are predicated on whether we obey God or not. His grace chased, was chasing after you when you were lost, yes. You can't do anything to earn that. But once you are saved, blessings only come when we obey. When you cross that line of salvation, blessings come when we obey. Let me give you two supporting texts to help you believe and understand that. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, notice the conditional clause of if, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, so you will be blessed. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then the same scripture, same section of scripture, 15, 10 through 11, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands. Notice Jesus is keeping his father's commands. Kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Wow, anyone lacking the joy of the Lord today, hang out with God and obey his commands. We hurt ourselves when we disobey what God says to clearly do. We bring strife on ourselves. Obedience, 
Blessings are predicated on whether we obey God or not. The second posture they did, so they obeyed. It was simple. Wait in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The second thing is they waited in expectation. They waited for the power of the Holy Spirit. They were looking. They were alert. They were waiting. Is that how we are today, though? I mean, we're so consumed with this world and so consumed with our daily lives. Are we waiting for the more that God has for us? And this is what was burning in me three weeks ago as I was praying for our church and worshiping him, is that we're gonna be a church that is wanting more and waiting for more. Are we alert? Are we thinking about the more that God has for us? They made room in their schedule for 10 days. For 10 days, they gathered daily together to worship and to pray and to be together. And then the Holy Spirit showed up. They made room in their daily activities. It wasn't just on Sundays when they got together. There's not enough time on Sunday mornings, y'all. I said, y'all. <laughs> they met daily and regularly together. That's why I love community groups, because we can meet more than once a week. And the Holy Spirit is never going to be confined to an hour and 15 minutes. Just want to give you a spoiler alert. He will not confine himself to an hour and 15 minutes. He's bigger than an hour and 15 minutes. We cannot come in here and go, oh, the Spirit wasn't moving. It's, he doesn't just move in here. He moves in your life all week. Amen. Come on now. Praise God. If we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up in our lives on Sunday, we've already messed up. You know what I mean? Because that's the more. Expecting more is expecting God to work as soon as we leave here today. When we go to pray for people that they'd be healed, that we would get words of encouragement for someone that only, only they and God would know, and God gives you a divine word, a word of knowledge. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's what these, these, these apostles were gifted at Pentecost. They were able to, to know things that only that person and God knew. And they were speaking for God in prophecy, prophesying over someone's life. I mean, we could be going out of this building with that, not waiting for just Sunday to have a moment or experience with the Holy Spirit. Is there room in our schedules for God to work in us and through us? Is there room? The third one is together in unity. Together in unity. Age, gender, race, backgrounds, opinions, experience, status, none of it mattered. It was about Jesus and doing as he says. And just so you know, nothing gets done at Calvary because of one person, except Jesus Christ. Nothing gets done around here because of one person. Pastor Kuhn and Angela never brought this church to this point on their own. It would be impossible. It took everyone, every team member, every minister, every volunteer, every person that sat in these seats and the seats next door that made us expand into here. It took everyone together in unity, focusing on our leader, Jesus Christ, and whatever mattered to him. I watched that growing up in this church. I watched us grow. I watched us work together. I watched every pastor serve with all their hearts, expecting no glory. I watched our, our lay pastors and our elders and our deacons and, and the wives and children serve here at this church. We only have gotten here because we've all been all in together and in unity. We were able to see the division come and we all agreed we will not let that divide us. And we stayed in unity. We were all able to see where Jesus was going and not worry about the peripheral preferences that get us all divided. And we focused on what Jesus said to do, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you to the very end of the age. That's what I witnessed at this church, and that's what's going to continue to grow this church and reach more souls. Now, I think that deserves a, a clap for God because of what he's done in this church. Amen. I praise you, God. We thank you. Thank you, God, for being faithful. When they were together, they did a couple postures. 
And one of them was worship. So number four, they worship together. I want to show you that in Luke 24, verse 50. Then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifted his hands to heaven. He blessed them while he was blessing them. I'm sorry, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So this is his ascension. As they worshiped him, or so they worshiped him and then returned to to Jerusalem, filled with great joy, and they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. And it wasn't just in the temple, because in Acts 2, 42 through 47, we see that they gathered in homes to do the same thing. God was greater and more important than any other person or thing. Jesus rose in their hearts to priority number one, and they had hearts that were all in for God. They weren't going to worship anything else but God. I think that's important for the church. Because sometimes we worship ourselves. Sometimes we worship other people's opinions. Sometimes we worship trends. We worship what other people say is going to happen. We don't spend time just worshiping and focusing on our God. And we need to be careful of that. The other thing they did together, the fifth posture is pray. And prayer. Prayer was a staple, a natural reflex, not a last resort for the early church. And notice that they prayed together because there was, there was encouragement and care and unity developed when we pray for each other. You know, when we pray together, I actually learn how to pray even more hearing how you pray. And you can hear how to pray and learn how to pray when I pray. And we can also learn how different we all are in our prayers. And it's okay if it comes from the heart. But we grow as we pray together. But we have to understand something too. Notice that Peter and John wasn't the only ones praying. It was the whole church gathered to pray. The church prayed together for breakthroughs in their ministry. The church prayed for plans to grow and to make decisions that were important. Just so you guys know, it's not all on Pastor Kuhn or the board to make decisions in this church. It's not on just them to pray. We all must pray together. And we must pray for our leadership to make right decisions for our fellowship. And I need your prayers. I need your prayers. This week has been a challenge. I can tell the enemy has been coming against us. We need to pray for each other. We're in this together, okay? This is our church, not just Pastor Kuhn's church or whatever. This is our church. And God has given us the ability to pray as well. And I have to be really transparent with you. Through my mom, God convicted me on some things because I found myself worrying, complaining, criticizing, using my time and my words to do that rather than using my time and my words to pray. And by the way, how does any of that help? It doesn't. But if I pray to God... That helps. And what God was saying to me in my prayer life, he was saying, um, I know that you have some opinions and thoughts on how things are going or whatever in your life or in the church or the people, but how many hours have you prayed for Sunday? Have you been praying for the flock, for the, for the sheep? Have you been praying for the people? God was like opening me up to say, Hey, instead of complaining and criticizing, how about you pray for them? How about you pray for God for me to move and to work? And of course, I'm not saying like, hey, God, smite that person. You know, it's not like that kind of prayer. (laughs) Because when you pray, it changes your attitude towards the person you're praying for. And if we spend more time praying for our pastor and praying for our leadership, and praying for our staff, and praying for direction and wisdom, we will see God move better. And even our, our, our concerns and criticism and complaints will just fade away. Because you become in line and tune with the Spirit and what He's doing in the church, not just this church, but in the church worldwide. God is doing a work nationwide and worldwide, and we better be ready. 
We don't have time to complain and criticize. We gotta be praying. We gotta posture ourselves with a different attitude here because Jesus is trying to work and move and he wants to use you. He wants to use you and us as a church together. Number six, the posture of hunger for more. They were just simply hungry for more. Yes, Jesus gave them a spoiler. He said, my spirit's coming, but they were hungry for more. And when, we were, when I was praying for this sermon and we were praying earlier today, it just came back to me. Do we want more of God? Like our actions, our, our words say we want more, but do our actions and postures say that? I mean, do we want more to the point that we're willing to not watch that episode so we can pray and wait for the Spirit to fall in your house and to minister to you and to give you messages for people that need it? Are, are, are we really wanting more, but we ignore our Bible time and our prayer time? Are we really hungry and expecting more? That's what I've asked myself, that if I really am hungry for more of God, I will posture myself to receive. I will position myself to receive because why? He promised that there's more. And if I believe in his promise, then I will show it by what I do next. I will step into the presence of God, my secret place, my time with the Lord to receive what he has promised for me. And lastly, Sharing and shining Jesus. Immediately, Peter begins to share and shine Jesus to his community. The outcome of the Holy Spirit coming was boldness and courage to reach the world. And he also had confidence because the Holy Spirit is Jesus living in us. What am I saying there? Well, Matthew 28 says that I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus said that. Well, how is that possible if he went to heaven? How will he be with us? Well, did you know that the word that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit, parakletos, means advocate. And in the Greek forms, it can also mean as if I'm right there with you, alongside you. So the Holy Spirit was Jesus alongside us. Therefore, he would never leave us. And he'd be with us to the very end of the age. So we have that promise as well that Jesus really is there. We're going to spend some time in worship and responding here today. Can we just turn off what's next real quick in our lives for a moment? Would you bow your heads and, and, and close your eyes with me and just think about this today? When I was praying, I just sensed that God was saying, we become content with our condition when I have more for them. We've been content in our pain, content in our depression. In other words, accepting that that's the norm. Maybe content and not feeling alive in Christ. Maybe content with just going to church and that's my Christian faith. And when I was praying, I just sense that God wants to heal marriages. He wants to do physical healings and miracles. He wants to deliver people from depression. And it's not just today, it's ongoing here at Calvary. We're gonna be a, a place of restoration for the broken. And at these altars or the seats, by the way, you can't escape the Holy Spirit. He will, he will meet you where you are. So it's not about where you go in this room. It's about whether your heart is postured to receive. So even right now, if you need more of God, you're hungry for more of God, you can make your way here. You can begin to pray where you are. You can make your way in the front because we have people ready to pray with you. But I'm trusting God. I'm stepping out in faith today that God wants to give you more. That he wants to pour out more of his spirit upon you to equip you, to heal you, to mend up things in your life. But we do need to pursue him. We do need to wait on him. For some of us, we've been waiting for a long time, so you're like, God, give me more, then that's great. 
For some of us, we haven't been waiting enough, and we need to. We need to wait for his spirit to show up and move. So if that's you today, come on forward, and let's pray together as we worship. You guys want to go ahead and start? Holy Spirit, sink in today. We absorb your spirit today. We're not afraid of anything around us or anyone around us. We seek your spirit, and may he sink in today. We worship you with our prayers and our worship. We want more of you, God. We're not content, God, with our brokenness. We want restoration and healing. We're not content with our addictions or struggles. We want deliverance today. We're not content with broken marriages. We want healed and restored marriages, Lord. We're not content with impossible circumstances. Everything is possible in you. Thank you, God. We receive today, Lord. This is just the beginning, God. We know there's more for us as we leave here today. We know there's more for us as we spend time in your word and in prayer in our homes. We know there's more for us as we minister to those in our community, God. Lord, we know you've called Calvary to be a lighthouse in this community and the fire will burn from this building. The fire of your Holy Spirit will be seen. People would drive by and be drawn to be here, Lord God, to receive more of your spirit, Lord God, to receive you, God. We thank you for the salvation that already took place here in the front today. We thank you, God, that you're bringing people home today to be with you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. I pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to equip my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, to be voices, Lord, and change in their community, God. Gift them, Lord, with your gifts, Lord Jesus. Bless them with your gifts, Lord, so they can speak unknown things to only those that know them, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to move by your spirit, not by our might or power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. We trust in that word. That's how we'll function. That's how we'll change Delaware. That's how we're going to make a difference in our homes, in our families, in our marriages. That's how we're going to make a difference, God, because we depend on your spirit. We receive the more. We expect more from you today, God. And that more is your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. So baptize today in Jesus' name. The promise that you've given for us today, Lord God. And Lord, I pray you would also open us up to more of your spirit in this church. We thank you, God, for the foundation that has been laid, a strong foundation of over 60 years of your spirit working. And you've established this foundation so that we can grow and change Delaware and beyond. So we can send missionaries out of this place. We can send missionaries into our homes and in other nations because of this place. We thank you that that's already taken place in this church. So we give you all the glory and praise for what you've done, Lord. And you're not done with this church, Lord. You have a plan and purpose. You're not done with the individual individuals in here, our church body. You're not done with them, God. It doesn't matter what age they are. It doesn't matter what age they are, God. You're not done with them. Every age is going to hell right now in our world. We're all called. We're all activated today to make a difference and to be disciples that will help people follow Jesus. So God, raise up our young children, Lord, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be speak, Lord God, your word to be courageous when everything's coming against them, when they're being told that that's not true. May they stand on the word as truth. Your truth shall reign forever, Lord God. Be with our youth, Lord, who are attacked daily, Lord, with different ideologies, God. Lord, shield them, Lord, and may they believe and be strengthened by your word. For our young adults and adults and our seniors, Lord, we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that the opportunity that we get to serve together to reach our community, Lord God. Lord, I thank you that you're not done with any of us and you have a plan to use us everywhere we go. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time together. We don't rely on just this moment, though. We're hungry for more of you. We're hungry for more of you. So be with us as we go our separate ways and be with us as we go to hang out with you throughout this week. 
In Jesus' name, amen.